So what, what I thought I'd talk about today is work we're doing on shaping our microbiomes for lifelong health. And um, it's, it's, really, it's, really amazing the, uh, it's really amazing how uh, research in the microbiome is changing how we think of ourselves as human beings. So for example, I'd like, to, I'd like you to take a moment uh, to think about what you saw when you looked in the mirror this morning. I saw an organism that was just 43% human, and not just because it was early and I hadn't had my coffee yet, but uh, when we think of ourselves as human beings, what makes up our bodies, each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, but about 39 trillion microbial cells, and that's where that 43% human number comes from. Now you might think, well, it's the 21st century, uh, should we be counting cells, or should we, pay, or should we be looking at our DNA and counting genes instead? So let's think about it at that level for, uh, for a moment. Um, so, uh, so, 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 to, um, so, so to each of our 20,000 human genes, we have two to 20 million microbial genes. And by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And what's most amazing about that is that when we're neglecting our microbial genes, um, not, uh, not only are we neglecting the vast majority of the genes that we carry around with us and their unique biochemical reactions, uh, but on top of that, we're neglecting the genes that we can actually change. So uh, this is really a big data problem. So each teaspoon of your stool contains so much data that it would take literally a ton of DVDs uh, to store that information that's encoded in the microbial DNA. And so sorting it out is really a tremendous challenge. And uh, a really important question facing us today is whether, uh, is, is whether controlling, um, controlling single pathogen species through the advances of public health and of medicine over the 20th century have led to a microbial silent spring situation in our gut, as it were, because uh, over, uh, over, over the 20th century, as the incidence of one infectious disease after another, from measles to TB, has dropped by, uh, by tenfold to a hundredfold, the incidence of non-communicable diseases like multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma has been skyrocketing, uh, increasing three or fourfold. And, um, and, and, it's, uh, and, and, and what, what's most amazing about that is that uh, just, just 15 years ago, when this information came to light, none of those diseases were known to be linked to the human microbiome. Whereas today, we know all four of those and dozens of others are not just associated with the microbiome in humans, but in animal models, we can, uh, we can cause or cure those diseases by modifying the microbiome of those animals. So, um, so, so this leads to a really compelling question on how can we modify our microbiomes to preserve health over our lifetime. And shaping our microbiomes begins at birth. And we found in work with Maria Gloria dominguez Bello back in 2010 that how we're born has a huge impact on our first microbiomes. Uh, so uh, if you come out the regular way, microbiomes from all over your body, uh, including, uh, in, including your mouth and your gut, not just your skin, but microbiomes all over your body look very much like your mother's vaginal microbiome. Whereas in contrast, if you're delivered by C-section, you start off with a completely different microbiome that instead looks like skin. Uh, so one thing we're working on at the moment uh, with, with Gloria is to find out whether you can, uh, whether, whether you can restore the microbiome of C-section babies. And essentially what we're doing here is, is we're, taking, uh, we're taking three groups of women, so those who are delivering uh, vaginally, those who plan C-sections with no medical, uh, no medical reason for the C-section, and then those who are planning C-sections who are willing to incubate sterile gauze and then apply, um, uh, th then apply their vaginal microbes all over their baby immediately in birth, uh, immediately after birth. And we showed in a paper in Nature Medicine a couple of years ago that uh, for a range of different bacteria and for a range of different body sites, this exposed delivery mode uh, was able to partially restore the microbiome, not just immediately after birth, but a month later. And so, uh, and, and so we're, we're hoping that this can reduce some of the diseases that are known to be linked both to C-section and to the microbiome, including things like obesity, uh, asthma, and uh, other complications, uh, other, uh, other diseases that are more prevalent after C-section. Um, another really important question, though, is suppose you're not doing something that seems as extreme as this vaginal inoculation uh, procedure. Uh, if, if you're delivered by C-section, what can you do later on that's able, to, uh, that's able to reverse those effects, or perhaps also reverse the effects of early life antibiotics? And uh, one, one thing that's emerging is that breast milk in particular may reverse some of these effects of antibiotics in delivery mode, which in combination have an especially profound impact on your microbiome. 
And, uh, and, and, and to research this question, uh, Lars Bodhi, uh, who works in the building that I work at, uh, BRF2 on the UCSD campus, um, started, uh, started this, uh, the, the center funded by the, uh, the Lars Rundquist Foundation, um, which, which is the largest breast milk research center in the world. And uh, what we're trying to figure out is what are the components of breast milk? Uh, is, it, uh, is it the oligosaccharides? Is it the antibodies? Is it the bacteria themselves that confer these health benefits on children, uh, on, on children and seem to be able to reverse the impacts of C-section and antibiotics? So, uh, so that, that's what happens initially. And then later on, uh, diet has a tremendous impact on how our microbiomes develop, uh, especially when we're adults. And uh, this idea that we are what we eat is certainly, um, is certainly not new. Um, it's, uh, it, um, it, it's, it's amazingly, it's amazingly intuition that food has a large impact uh, that, that we all have that's coupled to the difficulty in actually doing, um, in actually doing anything about it. And uh, Jeff Bland, who runs the Precision, uh, the, the Precision Lifestyle Medicine Institute, has a quote that I really like, uh, where he likes to say that food is a language that speaks to our genes in the sense that the genes that we have are fixed at conception, but how those genes are expressed varies tremendously. And a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the modulation of that gene expression, which has a big impact on our health, uh, is modified by the foods that we eat. So uh, the language of food is very much a language of color. And uh, you might have heard the idea that you, should, uh, that, that you should eat the rainbow. And if you think about a rainbow of food, everything from, uh, for, from the lycopenoids that are uh, the red of the tomatoes uh, to the carotenoids that are the orange of the carrots uh, to the anthocyanins that are blue and the blueberries, all of those are particular chemicals that uh, interact with our bodies and contain, uh, can, uh, contain genes in our bodies uh, on or off. Um, of course, uh, uh, re regrettably, the, the source of food closest to my, uh, closest to my house in Pacific Beach uh, is, is, is a convenience store. And when I take my seven-year-old there, she's, uh, she's confronted with a huge array of brightly colored packaging with brightly colored foods in there, uh, M&Ms and so forth. And, uh, but but I, think, uh, I think an important point to remember is that, uh, is, is that taking naturally occurring colors in food, stripping them all out, and replacing them with synthetic analogs that have completely different physiological effects may not be exactly what we're aiming for uh, when we want to eat a diversity of diet. So, uh, so there have been a lot of studies of diet, and what makes them frustrating is individual variability. So for example, there was a, there, there was a massive study published in 20, uh, 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, led by a group at the Harvard School of Public Health, but still one of the largest studies of, this, uh, of its type. And in the study, they looked at 120,000 people over a period of 20 years, tracking, uh, tracking the effect of every food item that those people ate on weight loss or weight gain. Uh, I regret to say more frequently on weight gain than weight loss, uh, given, uh, given the reality of what's happening in the American population. And uh, it's, true, um, it's, true that, uh, it's true that the foods that were most associated with weight loss and weight gain fit in very well with your, with your stereotypes of, uh, of, of, what, um, uh, of, of what thin people eat and what fat people eat. So uh, for example, the food that was most associated with weight loss was yogurt, uh, maybe no surprises there. But then the, the effect size was relatively small. So, um, so each serving of yogurt per day led to a weight loss of only about a third of a kilo per year. Whereas in contrast, the food most associated with weight gain was the French fry, uh, no surprise there. But then again, the effect size was relatively small. So each serving of fries per day led to a weight gain of about three quarters of a kilo per year. So, uh, so what this means is that if you're perfectly average and perfectly typical of the population, um, if every single day, 365 times in a row, you were going to eat a serving of fries and you gave it up and virtuously ate a serving of yogurt instead, the difference in your weight over, uh, over exercising that willpower 365 times in a row would be a little over a kilo, so uh, a little over two pounds. And you might decide that that wasn't really worth it given the effort involved. <laughs> right? But, but the issue is that that's population average effects, and the individual variability was really high. And uh, what, uh, what, what's frequently seen from personal experience or in clinical settings is that uh, these kinds of food substitutions have very large but very variable effects in different people. So maybe, uh, maybe if you do it, you'll lose, uh, you'll lose 20 pounds, but maybe if the person sitting next to you does it, they'll gain, uh, the, the, they'll gain 18 pounds. And so over the whole population, it almost all averages out. 
Um, so, uh, so, so, uh, so just uh, just four years ago, um, at, at the uh, sorry, just three years ago, rather, at the end of 2015, an Israeli group found a lot of the uh, a lot of the basis for this individual variation in response to food, not in the context of weight gain and weight loss, which takes a long time to track, but in the context of glucose responses. So, you've probably all heard of the glycemic index, uh, which is basically how quickly food turns into sugar uh, in your bloodstream. And um, what, uh, what, what, uh, what, what this group at the Weissman Institute, led by Aaron Alanov and Aaron Segal did, is they took 800 people and they measured a whole lot of fe personal features of each of those people, so their microbiome, uh, blood tests, questionnaires, anthropometric measurements, and food dietaries. They also hooked them up to continu continuous glucose monitors, and then they fed them a defined sequence of diets so, you, so they could see the impact of every food item on their blood glucose over a two-week span. And what they saw was amazing. Um, so what, what they saw was that when they averaged the results for all 800 people, uh, they perfectly recaptured the published glycemic index values, uh, like, uh, like, you would read off, uh, like, like you would read off a table. But uh, the individual variation in glycemic index was tremendous. So for example, they had one subject who every time they ate tomatoes, their blood glucose went haywire. And when they cut tomatoes out of their diet, they suddenly started doing much better. And uh, there was also a sizable fraction of the population where it was actually better for them to eat ice cream than it was to eat rice in terms of their blood glucose. Right, and so, learning, so, so on learning this, uh, typically people have two questions. Uh, the first question is, is there a test I can take to tell whether I'm in the, uh, whether I'm in the rice category or the ice cream category? Uh, and the answer is yes. It's, uh, they, they, they started a company called Day2 that offers this test in Israel and is trying to generalize it to other diets and other populations because the microbiome is very different in different parts of the world. But then the more interesting question is, uh, you know, suppose I found I was in the category of people who should eat rice, but I want to be in the category of people who, who should eat ice cream. Could I change my microbiome to achieve that? So, um, so, so that's a very interesting question, and to address it, and many other questions like it, uh, back in 2012 we launched the American Gut Project, uh, which is a crowdfunded citizen science project where essentially each participant supports the cost of adding themselves to the project. And, um, and, and so uh, at, this point, uh, at this point it's a relatively large scale for a citizen science project. Uh, we've raised over $2 million and sequenced over 20,000 samples, um, essentially, uh, essentially contributed one at a time by members of the general public. And um, what's, ma what's amazing about this is by having very detailed questionnaires and uh, huge numbers of samples, we can see uh, what has a large effect on the microbiome and what has a small effect. So for example, uh, you probably guess that your microbiome changes as you age, which it does. That's an effect that we can pick up easily. But uh, something, that's, uh, something that has just as strong an effect is how many hours of sleep you get at night. And you might not have expected that that had anything to do with your microbiome. But if you're getting less than six hours of sleep at night, that substantially reduces your microbiome diversity. So, um, so, so in, in, putting, uh, in, in putting this project together, uh, we were able to see uh, a number of things that had large effects like age and inflammatory bowel disease, whether or not you used antibiotics, where you need a few dozen people per group to be able to see those things. And then uh, smaller effects that you need hundreds of people per group to see, or even thousands, uh, things like whether you're male or female, uh, how much you sleep, uh, how fat you are, uh, how much you drink, uh, even how much you exercise, which seems to, uh, seems to interact with the microbiome. But amazingly, uh, what we saw had one of the largest effects was the number of different species of plants you ate in the two weeks before you sent in your sample. And we never expected that would have such a large impact. And what's amazing about it is unlike things like disease or the medications you're prescribed, the number of species of plants you eat is something that's under your control and you can do something about it. So you might want to consider that if you're, uh, if, if you're uh, back at the snacks table. Uh, there's a lot of different species of plant on display there. <laughs> Um, but I don't want to give the impression that it's all diet, so, uh, so there's other environmental microbes uh, that, that we get from things like uh, contact with soil, uh, contact with, uh, with, with healthy animals, uh, healthy plants and so on. And uh, for example, we've been doing some work with Chris Lowry at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, using a microbe from soil called Mycobacterium vaccae, uh, which we're able to use to inoculate mice against uh, a model of post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's starting to go into human trials now, where the mice are much more resilient to stress if they've been exposed to the soil microbe. 
Uh, and then Clef Capone, uh, a PhD student who recently graduated from Peter Durrestein's lab, has been working with us to look at the surfer microbiome and uh, understand which of the impacts of the ocean uh, are, are, uh, are beneficial in terms of the microbiology we're exposed to, uh, which of them are harmful, especially in terms of things like sewage outflow, fecal exposure, and so on. So, um, so, so diet allows us to modify the microbiome in a huge way, but it takes a long time. So most studies of diet, including our own, have shown that it really takes sustained effort over six months to a year to have a big impact on your microbiome and your phenotype. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes we need to do something a lot more drastic to give us a complete uh, ecosystem reset in our microbiome. And uh, one, one of the most, uh, so, um, so one, one of the most important hospital acquired diseases today is Clostridium difficile. And this kills something like 17,000 people a year in the US alone. It's a particularly nasty form of hospital acquired diarrhea. And people with C. diff have completely different gut microbiomes from healthy individuals. So, uh, so these microbiomes are so different from the microbiome of a healthy individual that it's like the difference between the microbes in soil and the microbes in seawater. It's like they're completely different ecosystems. So, uh, so, so, um, so given, given that they have this profound dysfunction in their microbial ecosystems, uh, what can you do to reset it? Well, uh, Bill Sanborn, who's here at UC San Diego and who's our chair of gastroenterology, um, has been working with a procedure called fecal transplant. And essentially what fecal transplantation is, is you take stool from a, uh, from a healthy donor and then you deliver it uh, either, either through the so-called northern route uh, from the top or the southern route from below uh, and, uh, and, and introduce those microbes into the gut ecosystem of these patients, um, uh, of these patients with C. diff. And what's amazing about this, uh, in, in, uh, in a very detailed time series that we did with Alex Kurutz and Mike Sadowski at the University of Minnesota, tracking people uh, every day after fecal transplant, is that in just one or two days after you do the fecal transplant, their microbiome resets completely from the unhealthy state into the healthy state. And that's coupled to all their diarrhea vanishing, and, uh, and uh, in, in some cases, uh, the patient's being able to get up and walk around again for the first time in years. And uh, what, what's amazing about this is that the last large-scale uh, large trial directly comparing fecal transplant to, um, uh, to, to, to antibiotics for recurrent C. diff had to be stopped early because the fecal transplant was over 90% effective, which is typical for, uh, for C. diff infections. The antibiotics were only 30% effective, and it was continued unethical to continue the trial given the huge difference between groups. And so the trial was stopped as a futile uh, trial, and the people on the antibiotics arm all got the fecal transplant, and essentially all of them, uh, all of them recovered. And so uh, one, one of the big questions facing us now is to figure out for what other diseases can we identify the sick state and the healthy state using the microbiome and transform the microbiome uh, from the sick state into the healthy state. Um, so, uh, so, so we can achieve a complete microbiome reset in a very short time using fecal transplantation. But another thing that we sometimes need is to introduce a predator to keep our bad bacteria under control. Uh, so another of my faculty colleagues at, uh, at UC San Diego, Stephanie Strafty, has a really compelling, uh, has, a, has a really compelling story about this, uh, where, where, she, um, where, where she presented, uh, presented that at TED at Nashville uh, rel relatively recently. And, um, and, and so, uh, and so this, this story is rather amazing. Uh, Stephanie and her husband Tom were in Egypt uh, looking at tombs uh, where, where Tom's, uh, Tom's passion, uh, uh, his, his hobby is archaeology. And, uh, and on, that, on, on that trip, uh, Tom, uh, Tom got tremendously sick and uh, had, to be, uh, had, had to be evacuated in an ambulance, uh, first, to a larger, first to a larger hospital in Egypt and ultimately back in the United States. And it turned out that in Egypt, uh, Tom had acquired an antibiotic resistant infection. And antibiotic resistance is a huge problem globally. And uh, it's, estimated, uh, it's estimated by the WHO that by 2050, superbugs that are resistant to every antibiotic that's known could kill 10 million people a year around the world. So, um, so, so Tom got the bad news uh, that, that he was infected with a microbe called Acetamana baumannii, which, uh, which is a so-called emerging pathogen, where uh, a decade ago it caused very few infections, but now it's a leading antimicrobially resistant pathogen uh, uh, worldwide, and, uh, and it's resistant to every antibiotic that we know of. And, uh, and, and so, uh, so, so Tom had been given essentially no hope by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by, by the infectious disease specialists. 
and, uh, and so as a last ditch effort they turned to an approach that was a century old um, uh, 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 where, where, uh, where, where what they were going to do is instead of using a drug they were going to introduce a predator of the bacteria, um, a, a bacteriophage which is a virus that feeds specifically on bacteria. Uh, so they were able to get uh, so they were able to get um, a, a waiver from the FDA because Tom was so critically ill and had essentially been written off as a hopeless case uh, to use uh, to use uh, to use viruses as an investigational new drug uh, to see if they could do anything to treat Tom's uh, asthenetobacter condition. And what was what was amazing about this is, uh, like like I told you about for fecal transplant, in just a couple of days he went from critically ill, non-responsive, uh, hooked up to a respirator, uh, to being conscious again, and then uh, and, and then uh, and, and then uh, ultimately he was discharged from the hospital. And uh, today you would have no idea that he was uh, that, that he was at the brink of death just a couple of years before. And so uh, th this got tremendous press coverage, uh, both both in the medical journals and in the popular press. And uh, Stephanie and Chip Schooley, who's our, uh, who's our chair of infectious disease, um, have set up a new center called IPA uh, IPATH uh, at UC San Diego to explore phage therapy. And uh, at this point, uh, IPATH has treated eight people, uh, of whom seven have recovered, uh, and all of these people were completely written off medically before uh, using phage therapy as a, as, as a last, as a last ditch treatment. And so uh, then the question is, should phage therapy only be used for these life-threatening illnesses, or is it one of these things where as it gains acceptance, we'll be using it for less and less devastating illnesses, and perhaps even for treating other things that are linked to the microbiome that are less immediately life-threatening but can be a problems over the longer term, uh, like for example obesity. So, um, so you might wonder where is all this research going? And uh, our vision for the future of all of this is that these technical procedures uh, reading out the microbiome are not always going to be done with million dollar instruments in the lab, but are ultimately going to be the kinds of things that you do at home. And uh, a good analogy for this is that if you look at the, uh, if you look at the sensor in the camera of your cell phone, uh, two decades ago that would have been at the center of a multi-billion dollar spy satellite, whereas today there are a few, uh, there are a few dollars a unit and, uh, and, and uh, as a result literally billions of people around the world have access to them. Uh, but if you think of the if you think of the, the the advances in semiconductors and the advances in computation uh, over the 30 years that separate things like the Cray 2 supercomputer uh, from the cell phone that you have in your pocket that has more computational power, the equivalent advance in that in DNA sequencing has taken not 30 years but only 15 years. So we need to think about in the next 15 years what separates the million dollar instruments in our labs from the kind of thing that you will be able to do in a consumer setting at home. And so, uh, so the vision we have is that maybe as you examine yourself in the mirror, uh, maybe as you breathe on the mirror, your breath will be whisked away uh, and uh, chemically analyzed by some technology, maybe mass spec, uh, maybe Raman spectroscopy. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities that are getting faster and cheaper all the time, just as DNA sequencing has gotten literally a million fold cheaper in the last 15 years. Uh, and then the idea is that we'll be able to take that chemical camera profile, use some of the same kinds of technology that back Google Translate to turn it into a microbiome profile like you would get from American Gut, and then place yourself on the microbiome map, uh, identify any risk factors that you might have, and then, uh, th then give you any hints for what you might be able to do at home to resolve it, or the advice that you might need to see a physician if it's something that's serious or uh, that you can't really take into your own hands. And then suppose you're given the advice that you're supposed to take, say, a particular probiotic. Uh, you could imagine your smartphone, uh, sorry, your smart mirror communicating with your smartphone so that when you're faced with a thousand yogurts in the supermarket, you can use augmented reality to zoom in on the one on the shelf that has the microbe or the, uh, or, or the, or the, or the prebiotic that you need um, so that you can take that, scan the barcode and confirm that you got it. And you could also imagine that, uh, that, that your phone would track your activity during the day, uh, your diet, uh, how many minutes you spent outdoors, which also has an impact on your microbiome, where you spent that time, like whether it was by a freeway or out in a park or on the beach, and all of these other things that are, uh, that, that are going to affect your health. And then communicate that back to your smart mirror to show you visions of yourself, say 5, 10, 20 years in the future, if you behave every day as you did today, or what you might look like if you did a little better or a little worse. 
So, um, so, so, that, so that, that probably sounds like absurd for science fiction, but most of the individual components of that exist already. Uh, they're just either too expensive to use in a consumer setting or they haven't been integrated with each other. And so what we're doing at the Center for Microbiome Innovation uh, that I direct at UC San Diego is solving a number of these kinds of problems, whether they're in health or in the environment or uh, various industrial problems that, uh, that, that involve microbes. Uh, with a growing range of, of corporate partners and over 120 UC San Diego faculty who are members of the center uh, working together to solve these difficult problems. Uh, so, so I'll leave the talk at that. Uh, at that. Um, I'm sure that's led, uh, led you to think of a lot of interesting questions and I'm really looking forward to going through those with you during the discussion. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to be here. So we've, we've got the questions from the audience. Um, I wanted to begin by framing it with just one backdrop question, which is key, and it may be in some of these as well. Um, and that's that uh, the research you're doing now involves human beings. It's mm -hmm. therefore human subjects research. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think most of the people in the audience know that when you do human subjects research legally, mm -hmm. you have to get approval from an institutional review board to mm -hmm. say that it's okay to go forward. And one of the things they look for is informed consent. And I know that that is one of the challenges for this. So can you speak to what, what you have to worry about and how you meet those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So all the research I talked about was, uh, was institutional review board approved. Uh, we work very closely with the institutional review board here. So uh, Anthony Madgett has been absolutely wonderful in terms of uh, helping us uh, frame uh, fr frame our uh, frame our consent forms and our uh, informed consent documents so that people are likely to understand them. And it's especially it's especially difficult in a changing field like the microbiome because when we started this stuff ten years ago, no one knew anything about whether the microbiome was going to be linked to uh, different health conditions. So, uh, so, so ten years ago, we published the first work showing that the microbiome was linked to obesity in humans. And uh, at about the same time, uh, Dan Frank and Norm Pace were doing the same for inflammatory bowel disease. But those were, those were diseases that you could tie into the gut. No one had any idea at the time that your microbiome might be linked to things like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or autism. So uh, in, in one pilot trial in Arizona, uh, autism has been ameliorated by fecal transplant, for example. And so, uh, and, and so what, we, what we know about what your microbiome reveals about you and uh, is, is, always, uh, is, is always evolving. So one, one thing we're doing at the moment is, is trying to figure out whether the microbiome can not just read out current state but predict the future. So we have uh, about 7,500 samples from the FINRIS cohort where it's Finnish people who uh, pooped in a cup for science in 2002 and we have their health condition in 2002 and their health condition now. So we're trying to predict what fraction of the bad things that happened to them medically. We could have predicted from that information they were just going to flush in 2002, right? But on the other hand, uh, if we can really predict your health future from your microbiome, that leads to a whole lot of potential for uh, the need for counseling. Um, uh, analogous to what you would have for genetic counseling. Uh, that, that, that wasn't an issue when, when no one knew that it would actually be useful. Yeah, so that gets to a, a core question I mentioned to you briefly before the program, and that's that um, almost inevitably the things that you are going to be learning will always be um, provisional and you know, it's not certain, but perhaps strongly indicating. So I heard your example of some some evidence that perhaps there's a there's a way to cure autism. I've you know and there and many of the things you mentioned in your talk talk about correlations between what you see in the microbiome and things that might happen to you. How, um, if at all, are you dealing with inviting people to be part of studies in which you will have information that they'll have access to, that that information is uncertain? How do they? How do you convey that to them? And. Right. Uh, well, well, it depends a lot on which study and whether it's clinically oriented or citizen science. So, uh, so the American Gut Project is all citizen science, where uh, we're, we're not getting access to medical records, uh, we're not capturing we're not capturing clinical information. So, uh, in in that sense, um, in in that sense, I think the uh, the, the ethical challenges are, are, are considerably less. Um, in, in, cases, in, cases like a, in cases like a trial where we're trying to figure out can we predict which medication is optimal based on the microbiome, 
um, a lot of the a lot of the informed consent is uh, driven by the same sorts of issues that you would have in other stratification trials, whether you were trying to stratify by um, whether you were trying to stratify by human genetics or by uh, by, by something uh, by, by some other characteristic of the individuals, and in terms of. Uh, and, and in terms of um, in, in terms of conveying ideas about uncertainty to a general public, uh, that that's uh, I, I think that's equally a challenge for all of these studies. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge for lots of things, but I guess even in, in a study where you are, I, I presume these the volunteers are part of the American Gut Project will get information back about what you found and have some sense of the diversity of their own microbiome, is that correct? Yeah, correct. So uh, what, what they get is they get, uh, so in American Gut, uh, if you participate, you'll get a readout of your microbiome. We will very clearly indicate on that readout that uh, it does not constitute a medical test. And uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of additional information to, uh, to, to point out that there's a lot of variability between different people that uh, if you have something that's common in you but rare, or other, uh, rare in other people, or if you're lacking something that most people have, that's not necessarily bad. And given the complexity of the microbiome, everyone's microbiome is unique and unusual, so you shouldn't panic if there's uh, some microbe that you read about in the news that you also have. Uh, that, that's, um, that's been reported to be linked to some disease because the, uh, because the strength of the linkage is often very small, especially for individual microbes. So, but there is, the, you know, I, I see all of that and I understand how as scientists there would be an understanding of that, but it seems to me pretty likely that there would be a lot of people who would look at this and read a paper in which you said, um, if people sleep less, their microbiome is less diverse, mm -hmm. and there is some indication, perhaps implied, that a diverse microbiome is good. So people might then start changing their life to sleep longer in the hope they would change their microbiome, when in fact it may not have been the cause of the diversity of the microbiome, but an effect or so. Right, well, well there's, there's two parts to that. One, one is that there's overwhelming evidence that sleeping longer is better for you, so if it inspired them to do something that was good for their health, uh, I think that would be fine even if the underlying basis wasn't the microbiome. Um, second, second is that issue of, of causality. So uh, in addition to the sort of population level uh, association studies, we also, do, uh, we, we also do a lot of experimental studies, either in humans or uh, with various collaborators on, on animal models. Um, and uh, in, including, including some studies at the San Diego Zoo where they're um, where, uh, like mostly, mostly conservation related, but for example, they're changing, the, uh, changing uh, the diets of their cheetahs and they want to uh, know what the, what the impact of that is on the microbiome. So uh, in, those, in those experimental contexts, we do have causality, but usually, usually the first step is to show association, and then if there's an association, you want to figure out what, what direction the causality runs. Okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm going to move to, there were, there were the questions that were first in the pile have to do with intellectual property sorts of issues. Um, so, uh, one, and it, in a part, it's an ownership question. The person who asked this first question was asking about the Henrietta Lacks example where, uh -huh. and I, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows about this, but it's a woman who um, was diagnosed as having cancer and some of her cells that were harvested ended up helping to fuel an industry of, uh, of research on cells that people often use. Um, so what is the conversation now about somebody's ownership of their microbiome and? Yeah, so the, um, so, so the conversation's very much on, a, on an institution by institution and study by study basis. So uh, what, what will typically happen is uh, you'll, you'll, sign, you'll sign some document when you enroll in the study saying that, uh, usually saying that there's no anticipated benefit back to you from participating in the study. Uh, or if there is a, if, if there is a benefit in a clinical study, that that, uh, that, that benefit is going to be clinical uh, rather than financial. Um, there, 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 have, there have been some uh, organizations like the BioCollective that have explored different, uh, different models of ownership. Um, what, 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 what happens is that you get very quickly into complicated issues, like suppose, uh, suppose the microbe is found in you, but it's also found in 
10,000 other people that there are samples from in the freezer. Um, should, uh, like, should everyone who had that microbe have an ownership stake? And then should it be limited to the people whose samples happen to be used for research? Or should it be everyone who has that microbe in their body or what? So, uh, so, so, you, so most institutions' perspective on it has been to encourage people to sign away the rights to any biological specimen as a condition of uh, participating in the study, which at least gives you a definition of, uh, of what's going on, uh, although not necessarily the definition that you would want. Um, where, where it gets really complicated is, uh, is things like working with indigenous peoples who have very, um, very complex microbiomes and uh, who seem to retain a lot of microbes that are lost if you live in an industrialized society. And some of them seem to be lost even if you've taken up farming as opposed to, as opposed to hunting and gathering. As far as I know, all of those research agreements specify no commercial use of any uh, biological specimen or information derived from the, bio, uh, from the biological specimen. But uh, once, the, once the information is uh, deposited in, in GenBank, uh, which is required for publication, that information is in the public domain. And so a third party like a company could potentially use that information for uh, developing a commercial product. And uh, under that circumstance, once the data is in the public domain, uh, the, the regulation on that is it can be used for any purpose whatsoever. So, uh, so, so then, then uh, how that interacts with uh, things like the Nagoya Protocol, uh, that's still being worked out for DNA sequence data. Well, that's interesting. So um, I actually, this is an opportunity to ask the audience, so by show of hands, how many of you think if uh, Rob uh, takes a look at your microbiome and finds an interesting bug in your gut, that you should, if there's going to, is an opportunity for financial gain from that. How many of you think you should be able to benefit from that? Anybody? Anybody think you have ownership of the bugs there? You didn't choose to have them there, at least not intentionally. So, it, I mean, it, it yeah. is an interesting question. What people in society expect? I mean, well, one, one, I wouldn't have expected people to think that. Well, one, one, one thing that might restrain your enthusiasm for thinking that you might profit off it is that the the Myriad decision, which basically says that uh, that, that genes uh, and, and different forms of genes that are linked to disease are naturally occurring phenomena and cannot be patented. Uh, that also that that also applies to the genes in your microbes. So uh, so something like a diagnostic test that's developed based on your microbes um, that uh, like the microbiome signature itself is not patentable. So uh, so what what it would have to be is it would have to be a microbe that was isolated from you and then was genetically engineered so it was no longer a naturally occurring organism. And then that genetically engineered microbe would have to go on to be a drug. It couldn't be a probiotic because it wouldn't fall under, under the uh, generally recognized as safe guidelines. So it would have to be a drug and then um, that implies a billion dollars in clinical trials and a 10 to 20 year process. So, um, so it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not that uh, your microbiome signature directly could be used for anything that could be a commercial product uh, that, that, that was based on that information, although it could be used for, um, uh, like if, if, if a commercial product was developed, it would be around things like the user interface for act, accessing the data or, uh, you know, the iPhone app it was embedded in or that kind of thing. So I'm not quite clear on that. So, so with the probiotic option, if you went that route, if I, if I formed a company and I said this is interesting, um, I actually bypass a lot of, of FDA work. Can't I just start selling that? Or? Nope. Um, so, so the things, so uh, it's a probiotic. If it's on the list of organisms that were grandfathered in, in in about 1970, or if you can prove that it was deliberately added to food as part of a traditional food manufacturing process, and people have been eating that food for at least hundreds of years. Uh, so, so if I find some new microbe on your skin or out of your gut, that's not a probiotic, that's a drug according to the FDA. And uh, so, so, um, so Rich Gallo, who's our chair of dermatology, ran into this with, with atopic dermatitis. So, so basically he was taking, uh, taking microbes from the unaffected patches of skin from atopic dermatitis patients and then purifying the good bacteria and then just uh, transferring them like from one part of the skin to another part of the skin uh, as a treatment for AD. And the FDA, the FDA told him that, uh, that that was a live biotherapeutic agent and he had to get an IND, so, so file an investigational new drug application, which took him six years to get approval for. 
and then uh, that, then it took him a year or two to get through the IRB. It took him about a week to do the experiment, which was highly effective, and then a few weeks to write up the paper and publish it. But uh, the, the regulatory challenge to working with live microbes is, is tremendous, and there's very few microbes that count as probiotics. So that's great, but just to be clear, if anybody's wondering, most science does not work like that. <laughs> it usually takes a lot longer for the science as well, so. Ab absolutely, in, in this case, the science was really dramatic, yeah. Yeah, so. which is why it was a shame that those patients didn't benefit six years yeah, exactly. earlier. No, that makes sense. Um, so there are a couple of questions, I think, with worries about what people might do with this information. Um, one of them, one person asked about, um, could there be, end up being a government mandated microbiome? Uh, well, let's just stop there before I go into the rest of the question, so. <laughs> uh, in North Korea, maybe. Uh, I, I can't imagine that flying in the US. Okay, so, you, you, so I, mean, to, I mean, this person hasn't elaborated here, but let me play it out. So if we discovered that um, a certain quality of microbiome made it less likely that you would require as many resources from your medical insurance, then the insurance might be predicated on the idea that if you make sure your bio, microbiome is adjusted appropriately, then you'll have a better premium. Um, well, that, that, wouldn't, that, that would be, a, that, that would be a, an insurance company thing rather than a government yeah, yeah, thing, right? So, um, so, 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 so yes, insurance companies already do all kinds of uh, all kinds of premium adjustments for risk, and it's very plausible that uh, that, that microbiome-based risk could feed into that. And that's okay as long as you have a choice of insurance companies. But if you don't really have a choice of insurance company because the plan's mandated by your employer, it becomes a lot more ethically problematic. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure that that's a problem with microbiome ethics versus insurance industry. Yeah, well, the, it's, it's obviously much larger than that, but it's, I mean, it is, it's, it's just adding microbiomes to the long list of things that might be issues that way. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that um, goes, that, that one of these questions relates to is um, this question of what information you have and how certain that information is. So you have people in the American Gut Project, for example, that are citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. um, they are contributing to science and that's something they thought was important. In that process, you're returning them certain information. Do you, ha if there was something you found in their uh, microbiome, that the information you collated, that suggested they had a particular disease, do you have any obligation, you know, it's, it was an unexpected finding. Do you have any obligation to say to them, you have a marker for X? Uh, we, we don't do any analyses that could be interpreted in that sense, so, so we, we avoid that issue by the design of the project. Uh, in, in particular, we don't run anything that could be, uh, could be interpreted as, as disease screening. Oh, interesting. So, so you steer away from anything that might, yeah. Yeah, so, so intentionally in the, in the American Gut Project, we don't do that. Uh, we do a lot of clinical projects funded by NIH or other agencies that are about developing those microbiome signatures, but we don't run those analyses on the American Gut Cohort. So this, the next question I think will be an easy one for you given the title of the book you co-authored, but it's, the question is, are we too clean today? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of evidence in support of the idea that the, uh, in support of the so-called hygiene hypothesis, which is that uh, lack of exposure to beneficial microbes is uh, leading, um, or at least contributing to incidence of chronic diseases. And uh, that, that's been worked out best in the case of uh, asthma and allergies. But, uh, but uh, th th this uh, increasing evidence that a wide range of other chronic diseases are exacerbated by not having exposure to a wide range of, of different microbes from the environment, especially in early life. So, so, I mean, a lot of that conversation is about what we protect our children from. Mm -hmm. Should we as adults be less concerned about washing our hands and uh, <laughs> so. well, well, it depends on context. So, uh, you know, if you, if you visited people in the hospital and you were in contact with, uh, with a lot of uh, people who were definitely sick with infectious diseases, uh, that, that's a great time to wash your hands, right? But if you're not, if, if, you, don't, if you don't think you're, 
if, if you don't have any reason to believe that you're uh, in contact with communicable diseases, there's no reason to use Purell 20 times a day or, uh, anything, uh, or, or anything like that. So, uh, so a lot of it depends on the, on the level of risk that you're, uh, that, that you're engaging in. Okay, so some news you can use, you can save on a Purell now. Um, so one of the um, sort of very philosophical questions that comes up um, is whether as, you know, if we reach that sort of nirvana you described of understanding the microbiome so well, um, is it plausible that the definition of what it means to be a healthy human being is going to change? We're going to see this in a different way. And that's yeah, I, I think our definition of, uh, of healthy is, is going to change substantially, and uh, especially it's going to change um, uh, as, as we understand how the microbiome uh, plays into our long-term health. So, uh, so for example, so, so at the moment, uh, a lot of definitions of healthy are based on rounding up some people who are healthy right now and some people who are sick right now and looking at the differences between them. But uh, just because you see a perfectly healthy 20-year-old at McDonald's um, it doesn't mean that they're eating a healthy diet right now, right? So, so being able to understand what changes in the microbiome happen before uh, long-term chronic conditions I think is going to be really helpful for preventing those conditions by introducing an expanded vision of health. The next question I'm going to just ask, because I'm not sure where they wanted to go with it, but they said, could you please describe the macrobiotic health test? Is how do you test a microbiome to decide it's a healthy microbiome or not? Oh, I see. So, so, what, um, so what we do right now is we uh, look at a lot of people with different health status, and then from the overall pattern of the microbiome, we use, uh, we use a machine learning classifier, typically random forests, to ask, can you classify it as uh, can you classify it into any of the disease states and then if it doesn't match any of the disease states we assume that what's left over is healthy so that, that gets back to uh, what I was just saying about uh, everything that's done at the moment is based on telling the difference between people who are sick and healthy right now and that's why it's really important to understand more how we can predict the future so I think a number of people were in, intrigued by the question of fecal transplants. I don't know if everybody in here had heard about that before, but you have now. Um, and, and this is a really good question. You can see how there might be an advantage of transferring certain beneficial bacteria. Um, is there a risk of transferring bacteria that are not beneficial, and how do we protect against that? Yeah, so for, for fecal transplant, you definitely do not want to do it at home, despite the instructions on the internet about how you might uh, with, with a uh, blender and a turkey baster that hopefully you won't use for anything else. Um, when, when, you, when you transplant stool, essentially any bloodborne or stoolborn pathogen could go along with that. So, um, so when, when fecal transplant's done in a clinical setting, uh, panels for viral and bacterial infections are always run. And this includes things like hepatitis and HIV, which can be transmitted if they're not screened for. Um, a really interesting question is what, uh, what long-term chronic conditions are also, uh, are also uh, transplanted. And uh, we, we can transplant things like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, uh, which we've done in collaboration with Sarkis Masmanian uh, at Caltech, all the way from people into mice. So the idea that you might be able to transmit it from one person to another is very plausible. Um, but then you probably won't get, you probably won't get to get a fecal transplant from someone who's sick right now, right? But then the question is, uh, if you got a fecal transplant from someone who doesn't have Parkinson's now but will develop it in 20 years, are you also going to develop it in 20 years? And we just don't know at this point. Uh, like that's a very active uh, topic of research at the moment. But it's also why uh, you, you need to um, you, you need to get an IND, so, so you need to treat fecal transplant as a drug according to the FDA rules, and the sicker you are uh, and the more immediately life-threatening your condition is, the more likely you can use a, an exotic therapy like fecal transplant or phage therapy before we know more about the long-term outcomes. Now, uh, the American Gastroenterological Association recently launched a national fecal transplant registry where the idea is to where the idea is to capture the donor and recipient micro and microbiome for everyone who undergoes fecal transplant in the US. And we're running the uh, biobank component of that through American Gut. So the idea is that uh, all of your data will be directly comparable to that data. 
and so uh, and so you know that's starting now. So in five or ten years, we'll know what the outcomes look like, five or ten years down the track. But that doesn't help you if you're deciding whether or not to do it today. Yeah, so it seems to me there would be lessons learned, and maybe people have looked at this, about how we decide that the blood supply is safe enough to, you know, the, the source of blood that we use. I mean, and I know, we know that we historically have had um, um, an, an accidental error with HIV transmission from Absolutely. blood supply. So. Yeah, absolutely. Every everyone in, involved in fecal transplant is very aware of that history. Uh, but then, but then, in the absence of uh, in the absence of pathogens, uh, I don't think there's any evidence long term use of donor blood could affect your physiology or your phenotype. Whereas, uh, at least in animal models, that definitely happens for the microbiome. So there's all the risks of blood transfusion plus some additional risks that we don't know yet. Interesting. Yeah. So question at the microphone, and thank you for coming to the microphone. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, uh, I'm a physician, I sort of uh, I work in family medicine and psychiatry, so I'm always trying to think of the overlap of chronic disease, because that's what we do a lot. Mm -hmm. And the book, The Body Keeps the Source, sort of transforming into a trauma-focused model, which overlaps with a lot of the things um, that are mentioned in the microbiome. And, you know, there's definitely evidence about the microbiome and how it affects the brain, but uh, you know, is there any studies or anyone you know doing research on how different things may affect the microbiome? Yeah, absolutely. So the gut-brain axis is one of the hottest areas of microbiome research at the moment. And uh, we're doing some work with Dilip Jesty uh, um, on uh, not just the microbiome and aging, which is his main research topic, but also on the microbiome and schizophrenia. Uh, there's, also, there's also a lot of other work in progress looking at the microbiome and, and monopolar and, and bipolar depression. So uh, yeah, again, again, these are these are very exciting and emerging areas, and you can you can transmit um, you, you can transmit traits that correlated with depression from humans into mice by transferring the microbiome to mice, uh, which is pretty which is pretty amazing. Um, so that that's been done by three or four different groups around the world independently now. So uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a huge area of growth at the moment. But what about this opposite? That's because a lot of there's a lot of evidence that trauma precedes some of the. Yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. We um, yeah, so we we recently did a study with a group in South Africa uh, looking at. Um, lo looking at childhood trauma and whether that had an impact on, on the microbiome, and so we saw we, we saw um, uh, weak but statistically significant results in the initial small cohort, and we're, we're scaling that up at the moment. Um, at least uh, at least in mouse models, uh, uh, social stress, um, so both single house stress and colony stress, uh, induce big changes in the microbiome, and uh, that, that's correlated with all sorts of adverse events. Uh, in adulthood later. So uh, again, there's a lot of very promising research directions, but it's early stage given that the first studies were only done three years ago. So just to follow up on that, so when you say there was a statistically significant difference, mm -hmm. statistically significant difference in what? The diversity of the microbiome or some other overall um, measure? What? In, in, in the diversity of, microbiome, uh, of, of the microbiome and uh, individually in a handful of taxa that, uh, that I'd have to look at the paper again to tell you which ones they were. Because, because I mean, because if you start looking at different tax, I mean, I'm, I'm, what's reminiscent for me is studies that look at brain imaging to look at differences in function, uh -huh. where you have a, you have enough areas that you're looking at, you're inevitably going to find something that changes. So, I mean, I'm sure you're doing cor corrections for the multiple tests that are done, but yeah, cor <laughs> yeah, correct. So we, we have to we we have to correct both for multiple testing and for the compositionality of the data. So. Uh, so, so it's highly multivariate data that lies in a simplex instead of Euclidean space, and uh, we, we have to we have to correct for that as well. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we um, th those those corrections were all done in the study. You're, you're exactly right, though, because if you look at uh, you know ten thousand different species, and your p values of 0.05, you're you're buying a lot of lottery tickets. Yes, to exactly. Find things that sound exciting. A lot. It's actually a well, lot. What's uh, one five percent of ten thousand? So, um, exactly. I think you had a. Question. I just wanted to know, um, who's performing safe fecal transplants today? Um, who's performing safe fecal transplants today is uh, pretty much any, uh, any clinician who is doing it, especially if they're affiliated with the university and uh, have to get institutional review board approval. Um, and so that includes the gastroenterology uh, unit at UC San Diego, for example. 
Um, if, you, if you go to the American Gastroenterological Association website, uh, uh, we, we have on there a registry of practitioners in, in different areas who, uh, who have registered with the AGA and uh, the practitioners on that list uh, are, uh, all, all subscribe to a common screening policy and uh, are participating in the National Fecal Transplant Registry. So um, in all of those cases would, I mean, is it being viewed as a clinical treatment or are those being viewed as research studies? Is that yeah, good question. So it's a clinical treatment for recurrent C. diff infection that's failed antibiotic treatment. For everything else, it's a research study. So if anyone's offering to do fecal transplant as a clinical thing, not as a research study, um, for anything other than C. diff, they're not complying with the FDA rules. And just a quick follow-up on that before the next question. So for C. diff, this sounds overwhelmingly effective. Yeah. Incredi I mean, almost nothing is that effective. Yeah. So does this mean C. diff is no longer a problem in, <laughs> in um, hospitals? I mean. It'll be much less of a problem, uh, you know, 90 to 95 percent less of a problem. Uh, then, then, then you get into the interesting questions about uh, why, why do some people fail that therapy? And uh, even 5% even of 17,000 is still quite a lot of, of deaths and there's a very large number of infections. But uh, yeah, it offers tremendous promise for something that's currently very intractable. What if, what is going to be the long-term consequences of a monoculture? Like, uh -huh. what if we find that one perfect biome and then everybody is seeded with it? What does that look like? Will a superbug take us all out? Like, sometimes I wonder about the hubris of man when we think we have this, like, perfect solution. Yeah, that, that's, certainly, that's certainly a very reasonable concern. Um, what, what happens with fecal transplant is although your microbiome uh, resets to a normal state, a lot of what's happening is you're, uh, you're, you're seeding the conditions where the microbes that were outcompeted by uh, C. diff and its friends um, that were in you uh, beforehand start to regrow. So it's not that you, uh, it's not that you switch over completely to the donor state. Um, you switch over to a healthy state that's a mix of you and the donor. And there's a lot of research going on at the moment to figure out uh, how that mix varies and, and what it looks like. Uh, if, if you were going to donate your own store, you would definitely want, uh, want to uh, get tested for HIV and uh, hepatitis and the rest of the suite of blood-borne and stillborn diseases. Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, that's, that's just uh, definitely too much of a risk uh, uh, otherwise. Um, but uh, essentially any program will do that, will, will do that pathogen screen. Mm, but so you don't see any like unforeseen consequences of like long-term? Well, I don't see the unforeseen consequences by definition, but uh, uh, but but I think uh, I think the premise that if we inoculated everyone with C. diff with the same donor stool, that they would all end up with the same microbiome. Uh, that there's a lot of evidence against that. Uh, so uh, so I think um, like based on the studies that have been done so far, what I think would happen is even if they were seeded with the same donor stool, they would end up with considerably different microbiomes a couple of years down the track. And uh, a fair amount of that would be reseeded by themselves, uh, by their family members, by their pets, by environmental sources. So, so I think uh, I, I think that's not where I'd look first for limits on diversity compared to, compared to things like the effects of, uh, of, of uh, high sugar diets, the effects of emulsifiers. Um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of other things that we're doing that are definitely depleting microbiome diversity that, uh, that, that we'd maybe want to address sooner. Um, I think we should stop there for time, so I want to thank you very much for a, a fairly interesting talk and discussion. Thanks again for the invitation. <laughs>